Verse 7, their feet run to evil, make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they have not known, there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. And then the conditions that follow. We grope for the wall like the blind. Verse 10, we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as at twilight. Verse 12, our transgressions are multiplied before you. Our sins testify against us. Our transgressions are with us. And as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. It's hard to believe that anybody could give such a catalog. And then in the middle of verse 15, we have the Lord's reaction. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, listen, and wondered that there was no intercessor. The last and the ultimate failing was what? No intercessors. Everything could have been changed if there had been one intercessor. Do you think that America is like that today? Not far away. Not very far. Well, we'll go on. The next one, and this is appropriate, it follows on, is supplication. Now, supplication is a kind of complicated word for some people. But when you are supplicating, or you are a suppliant, there is only one thing you ask for, which is mercy. That's right. This is simply a cry for mercy. We look at two passages, Zechariah 12 and verse 10. This is a prophecy directed specifically concerning Israel. The Lord is speaking. He says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Notice the order. First grace, then supplication. You say, well, God, I, I want to supplicate you. God says, you can't do it without my grace. If I don't give you the grace, you can't do it. See, No prayer of any value can be offered to God without his grace. If it doesn't initiate in the grace of God, it's worthless. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. It's very interesting because that really describes the turning point in God's dealings with Israel, at the point at which they really come to repentance and acknowledgement of the Messiah. And it's brought about by the spirit of grace and of supplication. God is so logical, you know. Uh, everything he does is, in a sense, computerized. I mean, it, it just comes out exactly right. See, when the Lord sent Jesus to Israel, Israel, as a nation, rejected him. Many received him individually. Because they had rejected Jesus, God did not reject them. He sent them the Holy Spirit. But when they rejected the Holy Spirit, there was nothing more that he could do. And there is nothing more that God can do for anyone who rejects the Holy Spirit. That's the ultimate. Jesus said, you can blaspheme against the Son and be forgiven, but not against the Spirit. But why I say that is because the process of restoration is going to reverse the order. See, a lot of people think that the Jewish people will first be confronted with Jesus. Oh, no. They'll first be moved on by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will reveal Jesus to them. And what I'd like to tell you is that process has already begun. It's very comical to watch it. Because God is sneaking up on their blind side. 
they don't know what's happening to them. I've talked to so many. And it takes a certain amount of wisdom to know at what point to stop. Leave it to the Holy Spirit to finish. There's another picture of intercession or supplication, a beautiful one in Hebrews chapter 4. Isn't it interesting? They're both related to the Jewish people. Hebrews, of course, is written to Jewish believers. I hope I'm creating in some of you a desire to learn to play your instruments. <laughs> Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's a terrific scripture. It's a throne, but it's a throne of grace. And what do we come for? To obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See, people say, well, the situation is so serious, there's nothing left to do. But God says the time of need is the time to come. And you know about both mercy and grace, there's one fact that applies to both. They cannot be earned. You cannot earn God's mercy. If you could, you wouldn't need it, see? And you cannot earn grace. I am convinced myself that the only people who don't receive mercy and grace are the people who don't come. Because if we do come, we will receive. What's the root problem? We don't come. Why don't we come? Because we don't see our own need. What keeps us from seeing our own need? What blinds us? Self-righteousness. Religiosity. All right, we're going on the prayer of command. Now we're in a different area, in Joshua, chapter 10. That's what's so exciting about the Bible. It is not monotonous. Ruth and I would say to one another, at least there's one thing we cannot complain, our life is not dull. <laughs> Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 and following. This is in the middle of a battle. Israel were defeating their enemies, but it was getting dark. And if night fell, they wouldn't be able to finish the job off. So it says, then Joshua spoke to the Lord. Notice he began by speaking to the Lord. In the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he, Joshua, said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still over Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this, is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. And there has been no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord heeded the voice of a man. Well, that's the prayer of command. You can tell situations and circumstances how to behave, even the sun and the moon. But you can't do that unless you first contacted the Lord. And you've got the anointing, the release. There was a brother named Howard Carter way back in the early days of the Pentecostal movement in Britain, the author of the first book on the gifts of the Spirit, and the most, I say, the soundest book. He had a Bible school in London. Well, in World War I, he was a conscience objector, and he was put in prison. And uh, the prison was a very damp, leaky place. And he was lying in his bed, and there was a little stream of water trickling down over him from the ceiling. And he pointed his finger at it and said, I command you to go back in the name of Jesus. And it did. <laughs> you say, well, that was a generation ago. In Zambia last year, when we were having the meetings, there was a black African girl of about 16 or 17 bicycling to the place where we were eating. And they have vast anthills in Zambia, 20 or 30 feet high. And they're the homes of snakes. 
And as she was bicycling past and coming to this anthill, out came this big black cobra out of its hole in the anthill. And she began to tremble. But the Spirit of God came upon her and she said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, go back into your hole. And it stopped and turned its head and remained motionless. She said, no, I said, go back into your hole. And it turned around and went right back in. <laughs> When she got to where she was coming, she was trembling. So that was str God's strength made perfect in weakness. But that's, that's one way we can pray, understand? Particularly appropriate for demons. All right, the next one is the prayer of commitment. Very, very important. Psalm 31, verse 5. Sometimes, you understand, the way to pray about something is to stop praying about it. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Though, of course, those words were said by Jesus, the first part of them, on the cross. But there are times when we just have to commit ourselves to the Lord. I remember the first time I ever preached in Denmark in 1947. I was there on my own, Lydia was still in Jerusalem. But it was very important because I was being introduced everywhere as her husband. And it, it was very important that they thought well of me for her sake. So they introduced me to the Dane who was to be in my interpreter. And I quickly realized he didn't understand more than 50% of what I said to him. And I thought, what am I to do in this situation? I mean, I was absolutely, I thought, this is hopeless. So in despair, I said, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. And I don't know what happened, but we had a tremendous meeting. <laughs> I don't know whether he said what I said or what he wanted to say, but I mean, the results were tremendous. <laughs> I just had to take my hands off. There was nothing more I could do. Psalm 37, I'm sure many of you know that. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. The Hebrew says, and you may notice it, roll your way on the Lord. This became very vivid to me when I was working with students in Africa, East Africa. Sometimes we'd run out of rice in the students would have nothing for supper, so I would have to go down to the local town in my little Morris Traveller station wagon and get two sacks of rice. They weighed 220 pounds each, I think. And then one of the things wrestle, we wrestled with in Africa was as soon as they started to get educated, they thought it was demeaning to do physical work. So I used to demonstrate to them that that was not so. So I would drive up to the kitchen, pick up one of these sacks, put it in my back and carry it into the kitchen. Well, the, it's easier to get one on than it is to get one off, you know that? I mean, because there's... So I learned the secret, is roll it off. And that's what the Lord is saying. When your way becomes too heavy for you and you can't handle it, just roll it off onto the Lord and He'll take care of it. Commit is an act, trust is an attitude. First of all, you commit, and then you don't go back and see if it's working. You trust, you see? It's like taking money to the bank and making a deposit. You get your receipt. You don't walk back 30 minutes later to see if the bank knows what to do with your money. You have committed it to the bank. If you commit something to the Lord, leave it. I remember years back in Ireland, there was a little boy who was a cousin of mine who was six years old, and he'd planted some potatoes. It was a farm. But he was so anxious to see if the potatoes were growing that he would go back and dig them up. You know? well, <laughs> he never got any potatoes. A lot of Christians are like that. They plant their potatoes and then they dig them up to see if they're growing. If you commit, then you've got the trust. And while you trust, the Lord is doing it. All right. The next prayer is dedication. 
John 17, 19. This is part of um, the, what we call the high priestly prayer of Jesus. And he's talking now about his relationship to his disciples and to the Father. And he says, for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Now, to sanctify means, in part, to set something apart to God. It's okay. Um, whatever you want to set apart to God, you sanctify. And then it belongs to God, it's in his hands, and you are not allowed to do what you want with it. Jesus said in John 10.35 that the Father had sanctified him and sent him into the world. Well, how did the Father sanctify Jesus? He didn't make him holy because he was already holy. But he set him apart to a work that no one else could do. Now Jesus at this point says, I sanctify myself. I set myself apart to the work for which God has already set me apart. That's sanctification, understand? Always the initiative is with God. You can't sanctify yourself in that sense for something for which God has not sanctified you. You don't have to be a volunteer. You have to find out what God has set you apart for. And then you set yourself apart. It won't work till you set yourself apart. But if you set yourself apart for something for which God has not set you apart, it won't work either, you understand? So you have to find out what God has set you apart for. And then you have to respond with your own will and decision. I set myself apart. And after that, you are not your own property. Understand? And don't play games with God. Don't set yourself apart on Tuesday and ask for yourself back on Wednesday. Because God doesn't meet you on that basis. There's another example of this in a well-known passage in Romans 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So Paul says, you are to sanctify your body to the Lord. You are to present your body to the Lord. It's an amazing thing that multitudes of born-again Christians have never discovered that. God has set us apart, but it doesn't become effective till we set ourselves apart, you understand? And God wants your body. Because when he's got your body, he's got you, see? And when you've set yourself apart, your body, to God, you don't make the decision. It's not your body any longer. You don't decide what it'll wear, or what it will eat, or where it will go, or what it will do. It's not your property. See, whatever you sanctify to God becomes his property. You don't have to do it, it's voluntary. The Bible says, don't vow and then ask for it back. That's the way to get God angry. Be careful what you say. But when your body is sanctified to God, remember it's God's responsibility. God has a different attitude towards the property that is merely leased to him and the property which he owns. You understand? <laughs> he accepts maintenance responsibility. <laughs> for what he owns. Some people, that's the answer to your problem. Give God your body. <laughs> You've struggled with it long enough. <laughs> so that's the prayer of dedication. Then there's the prayer, we're coming near the end, the prayer of persistence. Luke chapter 11. Verses 5 through 10. And Jesus said to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loads, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. A terrible disgrace 
in the Middle East. I have nothing to set before your friend. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. Typical Middle Eastern scene. I say to you, though you will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. In other words, you stay on knocking, just letting him know he's not going to get any sleep that night until he gets up and gives you the bread. Now, Jesus commended that. He said, I say to you, ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks and keeps on asking receives, and he who seeks and keeps on seeking finds, and to whom who knocks and keeps on knocking it will be opened. See, that's quite different from the other, which was the prayer of receiving. You pray, you receive, you say, thank you, Lord, that's it. This is a different kind of prayer. You've got to go on knocking, 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 knocking till the door is open. There, this is a true story. There was a lady, a South African lady, a missionary, her name was Ingrid Chona. She wanted to get into Mozambique, which was at that time under Portuguese government, to open a Protestant mission, and the country was almost exclusively Catholic. She went to the Mozambique consul and asked for permission once. She was refused. She went again. She was refused. She went again, she was refused. She went again, she was refused. Do you know how many times she went? 33 times. And the 33rd time, she got permission. That's asking and keep on asking, understand? If you really believe you're going to get it, you won't stop. What's that lady Bible teacher who's on the television? Marilyn Hickey. Hmm? Marilyn Hickey. Marilyn Hickey. She was talking to us uh, just over a year ago. She's kept saying this, remember, the game isn't over till you give up. <laughs> That's the truth. The game isn't over till you give up. The only way you can lose is by giving up. Don't give up. And then two last prayers. The prayer of blessing. Number six. Familiar words to many. Numbers chapter 6, verse 23 and following, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. See, there's a six blessings. Do you want to follow them again? Number one, the Lord bless you. Two, keep you. Three, make his face shine upon you. Four, be gracious to you. Five, lift up his countenance upon you. Six, give you peace. Now, how many of you know six isn't a perfect number? So when I saw that, I thought, Lord, that's going to be with him something more. And he showed me this. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel. That's the seventh. That's what makes it complete, putting his name. Parents, that's how you can bless your children, you know. You can put the name of the Lord upon them. Every day when they go to school, every day when they're out in the roads, you put the name of the Lord upon them. And he will keep them. What a privilege it is to be able to bless. But there's another side to that. Most Christians are not aware that we are also charged to curse. Matthew 21, verse 21. Remember Jesus walked past the fig tree and it had no fruit on it, only leaves. Like a lot of things we see today, they look as though they got fruit on, but there's none when you look. Jesus was not indifferent. He didn't just say, well, nothing there. He said, let no one ever eat fruit from you again. Next morning when they passed the fig tree, it was withered from the roots, 24 hours. The disciples were impressed, and this is what Jesus said to them. In Matthew 21, 21. So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, 
you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it shall be done. Now we all focus on removing the mountain. But remember Jesus said you can also do what was done to the fig tree. Which was what? It was cursed. Um, some of you have heard this story, but it's a true story and it's a good illustration. I was kind of associate pastor of a church in Chicago in about 1967 in the north side in downtown Chicago. And the church was on a corner, but the actual corner was occupied by a liquor store, which was wall to wall with the church. It was a very wicked place. It not only sold liquor, but it was a center for prostitution and drugs and so on. Well, sometime in October one year, we were having a prayer meeting in the church and I was on the platform and something came over me and I stood up and I said, Lord, I curse that liquor store in the name of Jesus. And I forgot about it. Just around about Christmas time, we got a phone call at 4 a.m. The temperature was 20 degrees below zero at the time. This dear lady from the church said, Brother Prince, the church is burning. Would you like to come and see? So frankly, I didn't have any motivation to get out of bed at that time of night and go and see. But I thought, well, if I don't show any interest in the church is burning, I'll be considered <laughs> somewhat callous. <laughs> so reluctantly, Lydia and I got out of bed and climbed into the car and drove down. Well, we could see the flames two or three blocks away. When we got there, we discovered it wasn't the church that was burning. It was the liquor store, but the wind was blowing off Lake Michigan, straight blowing the flames onto the church. And as we there, the wind changed 180 degrees and blew the flames away from the church. And the church suffered no damage at all except smoke damage, but the liquor store was totally demolished. And the fire chief of Chicago said to the elder of the church, you must have a special relationship with the man upstairs. Well, I knew why that liquor store burned down. I had cursed it. And I tell you, it, well, it didn't make me feel proud. It scared me. I thought, I better think about what I'm saying from now on. <laughs> but it's, it's there. And you see, I think a lot of Christians are too indifferent about some things that are evil. I think that, I mean, you have to be very careful how you do this, but I think if the Spirit of God prompts you, you can cause something to wither like that, that's harming people, deceiving people, frustrating the purposes of God. Jesus was not, he was never indifferent. He was never neutral. He was either for or against, and he expected everybody to be like that. He said, he that is not with me is against me. Let me just read my little list of instruments and we'll close. There are 12. Thanksgiving, praise, worship, petition, intercession, supplication, command, commitment, dedication, persistence, blessing, and cursing. For more great teaching from Derek Prince, tune in to Derek Prince Legacy Radio on a station in your area. Or you can listen online anytime at DerekPrince.com.